in a very familiar well environment i guess zoom is familiar to everybody to us but also the people who are watching here many of them are quite uh, familiar i am quite i'm very happy to be quite familiar with so um this is a talk which is i think uh a bit of an outlier to this seminar i apologize because indeed the bs here is backwards stochastic and not black shows sorry for that <laughs> um uh and uh so what is the what is the the question the question is about rough volatility models and uh this is actually a product this this paper is a product of my last uh, uh, research trip that I did before the coronavirus. I visited my friend Chinyao Xu in Calgary, and I asked him a question, a question which was motivated by a paper that I had written with uh, Raoul and uh, Søren Wolfers. And to my surprise, he had a very nice answer to that question. And uh, I'm very happy to talk about this answer and also to some ongoing questions that are related to this. So, outline. Uh, I will start with a very short recall of rough volatility models. I mean, I am aware that uh, this is not the, uh, 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 I mean, this is my main research to topic nowadays, and there are also a couple of people in the audience who, who have worked on this topic. But the basic question is the following. The basic model is of the following type. We have a process S, which is driven by something which looks like a stochastic differential equation. So you have this, uh, 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 this uh, dynamics with respect to a Brownian motion. Actually, we have two independent Brownian motions, which I denote by W and B here. And there is another process V, which we call the variance process. And at this point, V is just an arbitrary process, which is driven by W alone, okay? So that's why I have this weird notation of the Brown emotion. We have two Brown emotion, W, which drives V, and W drives together with V, the process S. And to be more concrete, we have two specific cases in mind. One is the rough Bergomer model, where V is of a rather simple exponential type as a function of another process, W hat. And W hat is a Volterra type integra integral of the Brownian motion. So this means uh, you should think of it as being some kind of fractional Brownian motion. I mean, the, it's not the classical fractional Brownian motion, which, which has a similar representation, but this is much more complicated for the classical fractional Brownian motion, but it has similar properties. And another example, which is a bit more tricky, a bit more complicated is the rough Heston model, where the V is already given in terms as something like a stochastic integral equation of a Volterra type. So Volterra type is really this kind of equation where you have this a kernel K involved in the integrals. And you see that there are various difficulties with this approach. The first one is that neither of these models, so the V is not the semi-martingale, which means we are kind of outside the standard stochastic calculus world, and it's neither, neither is it the Markov process. So V is not the Markov process in either of these examples. And the reason is again, the kernel K. All right, and rough, the, the, the adjective rough here should, in these examples, it basically means that the Hurst, the Hurst uh, index H is very small, close to zero. So think of something like 0 0.1. And that is, I mean, in, in, in theory, this is not really, re really relevant for all of this discussion, but in practice, this has very important consequences. So, um, okay. Before I come to the challenges and uh, difficulties involved with the model, I think I should also tell you that there are some good uh, properties of the models. So there are reasons why we like the models. And the, uh, and the main reason is that it's very uh, good properties with respect to real life data, to real market data. So it provides excellent fits to the data in particular 
like in the short end. And you see here from an implied volatility surface, the short end is where uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of things going on and where it's difficult to model the surface. And uh, this is basically, I don't want to, to go very much into the details. I mean, this is a motivating example, but uh, the actual topic of my talk is, is kind of a theoretical model. So you don't really need to, 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 to know too much about this motivating application. Uh, the bottom line is we like it because we think that it provides really good uh, uh, fit uh, in this uh, application. Having said that, there are a lot of challenges and they are, as I already indicated, they are related to the fact that the process that we're working with is not a Markov process. And that means, for instance, there is no pricing PDE. That means that most standard methods for stochastic optimal control fail. It also means that a lot of structural methods for option pricing fail. For instance, also large deviation uh, principle-based asymptotic formulas become untractable. I mean, the LDP themselves may actually, uh, uh, you may actually be able to, to, to verify that LDPs are, are still valid, but uh, the problem is that the rate functions are then given in terms of uh, infinite dimensional variational problems. That's not really something you can compute. Well, at least not easily. And finally, simulation methods, um, they work in principle and this is the standard method to price options actually in this type of mo uh, models. But even here, they may be quite slow and they are very hard to analyze. And uh, together with Raul and uh, uh, Eric, who is also here, I think we have, uh, I mean, they can tell you more about how hard it is to analyze the, uh, uh, these methods. Um, so, but there are also a lot of developments in this, uh, 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 in this field, so which became more and more popular. And as a matter of fact, uh, two of our frequent project partners, Jim Gederal and Matthew Rosenbaum, were awarded the quant of the year this year for their seminal works on rough volatility. So indeed, the quantitative finance community is really taking uh, uh, notice of uh, uh, these developments. So, okay, nonetheless, a lot of the, especially when it comes to numerical applications, a lot of the developments are really, uh, uh, you know, I would say rather ad hoc and a really fundamental and uh, 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 structural approach is largely missing, I think. So of course we would be happy to provide one. Now, in the beginning I said that uh, uh, this is related to, so what, what is the question that uh, I asked my colleague in, in uh, Calgary? Well, if you look at back at the model, at the principal model, you have uh, the dynamics of S and this really looks like a stochastic differential equation. But then you also have the, so in some sense, Instead of just saying that this is not the Markov process, I mean, neither V is a Markov process nor the pair SV is a Markov process. So instead of uh, just stating that this is not a Markov process, can we reasonably view, view this process as a Markov process within a non-Markovian random environment V? Okay, in other words, can we make sense of uh, this dynamics of S, which in itself just tries to be a Markovian dynamics, if that makes any sense, uh, except that the V, of course, kind of destroys the Markov property. And there is some evidence of this, and this is the, this is what we observed in the paper uh, with uh, uh, Raoul and uh, uh, and Sören. So that paper is actually a paper on Markov processes on computing optimal stopping uh, problems or in the, in the financial lingo American option pricing in Markov pro, uh, for Markov models. And 
we still decided to try out what can we do about this kind of rough Bergomi model and this kind of rough volatility model. And we did what would be like the, you know, the naive approach. And that is, uh, okay, we know that SV itself is not a Markov process. So just let's add the past, past information into our state, okay? So fix a capital J, and the state is now not just the value of S and V at time T, but additionally at uh, 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 the times uh, T minus J delta T for J from zero to capital J. And then we tried to solve the problem and we realized that actually capital J equals to zero gave us the best results. Okay, in fact, this is what the table shows. Uh, please note that in this table, I mean, the, the, first, uh, the first row gives the European option prices just as a comparison, just to, to show that there is something going on when you introduce the, the optimal stopping feature. But, uh, in, in, and then you have this three rows about three different values of capital J, and those numbers, higher numbers are better. Okay, so these are uh, low biased estimators. So higher numbers means the results are better. And you see that capital J equals to zero gives you the best numbers. I mean, it's not a big difference, but still. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about it because, and this is what you see on the, on the figure on the right-hand side, you see an exercise boundary for such an option or for some fixed time as a function of the two variables, V and S. And you see it depends much more on the value of S than on the value of V. And so the naive thinking goes, and by naive, I mean my thinking, my naive thinking goes, well, that makes sense because V in some sense is already a perturbation kind of, I mean, gives you a perturbation of S and S itself wants to be Markovian. So, the highest order effect should come from a Markovian dynamic, from a Markovian problem. And of course, J equals to zero would be the Markovian situation. All right. So this is for the motivation. Now let me jump into the actual problem. Okay, so what is the setting? Again, we have a, a, a process V, which is defined on, uh, which is generated, which is uh, 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 driven by a Brownian motion W and we have a second Brownian motion B. And we consider the filtration F generated by both Brownian motions, but also the filtration FW generated only by W. And now I pass to the log price. So XS is the log of S, okay? And this of course satisfies the dynamics that is given there in this formula. And now, I introduce a family of such processes indexed by T and X and I satisfy this dynamic and they started at, uh, at X at time T. Okay, so they are only defined for S larger than T. Okay, and uh, given a pair of function H, I define now a function U T of X, which is the conditional expectation of yeah. H applied to the terminal value time capital T of the process X conditioned on FT. Um, all right. And you see, this is a random field. And the random field, I mean, it is a function of two parameters T and X, which is random. Um, Maybe before I continue with the assumptions, let me, let me go ahead to the next page because you see in the Markovian world, ut of x would actually be a deterministic number. Okay, because if x was a Markov process, then, uh, you know, this is the Markov property. The uh, uh, future is independent of the past given the present. And therefore, the conditional expectation is just not needed. I mean, I could just write expectation rather than conditional expectation. And of course, in this case, we all know that U satisfies the Kolmogorov equation, Kolmogorov partial differential equation, okay? So in other words, 
the UT in the Markovian world would be the solution of a deterministic partial differential equation. So it would particularly be a deterministic function. But of course here, this is just not true. This is not a, Marco a Markov process. X is not a Markov process. And therefore uh, this Marco Markov property that is, the uh, uh, future is independent of the past given the presence is just not true. And therefore this is a random field. Okay, so what are the conditions that we impose? Well, the main condition is that V is large or equals to zero, has continuous trajectories. And anyway, so the, the, I, I, I may be repeating things that I said before, but uh, uh, in any case, I, I'm sorry for the interruption. So that, let me once again say that you, if you if x was a Markov process, then u would be a deterministic function and it would satisfy the standard Kolmogorov equation, PDE. But since it's not, it's a random field. And we will see what can be done about such a random field. And regarding assumptions, uh, technical assumptions, well, the main technical assumption is, it's a very mild assumption, I think, V is a, a non-negative process, continuous trajectories adapted to the fluctuation generated by W alone, and it's, it's uh, integrable in the L1 sets. Okay, so that's basically all that we are requiring here. Um, great, so let's go back. Again, we have a, if X was a diffusion process, we have the Kolmogorov backward equation. So if X is in particular the Black-Scholes model, then that would look like this, right? So this is the Black-Scholes PDE, not in the usual form, but uh, formulated in terms of the log price. Um, now, what is the idea? The idea is basically what we would like to do is we kind of externalize the stochastic uh, volatility in the pricing PDE and Okay, so, so what I mean by this is take the Black-Scholes PDE and replace the sigma squared by our process VT. Okay, there, are, are, there is one problem with this approach. And that problem is uh, that uh, if we do this, then UT becomes random. And now of course we have an issue. I mean, the issue is we have a differential equation a random differential equation with a terminal condition. And uh, if you think about stochastic ordinary differential equations with terminal conditions, then we are suddenly talking about this kind of uh, scary world of BSTEs, backward stochastic differential equations. So in other words, just formally replacing uh, the uh, deterministic constant uh, uh, sigma by a random process V here would induce us to believe that maybe we are dealing with a backward stochastic partial differential equation. Now, I personally am not an expert into BSTEs and I suspect that many in the audience are not expert either. So let me take the opportunity to give a very short uh, uh, recap of backward stochastic differential equations. Okay. So now I'm changing the setting. I have now a Brownian motion W tilde, which may very well be a multidimensional, even though everything is formulated in 1D here. So this is now my Brownian motion, which has nothing to do with the setting before. And I'm considering a backward differential equation. So in other words, this means I have a differential equation Y with a terminal condition. Okay, so the terminal condition a terminal time, y takes the value xi, where xi is just a random variable which has uh, you know, the right kind of measurability conditions. So it's F capital T measurable. Now in many situations, there will be a second process xt solving a forward STE and xi will depend on x. Xi will be for instance, some function g of x capital T. And then the dynamic of Y could also depend on X. But let's just uh, focus on this simpler example. 
Okay. And you see there is a tension between the two constraints that we have here. We have the one constraint, which is the terminal condition, the explicit constraint, if you want. But there's a second constraint. And the second constraint is implicit. But it is there as soon as we talk about stochastic differential equations. Because if you want to do standard stochastic calculus, we need processes which are adapted to the filtration. So adaptedness is kind of implicit constraint. And if you're coming from uh, the world of uh, the deterministic world, this is kind of uh, uh, confusing at first, because if you look at ordinary differential equation, there's really no big difference between going forward in time and going backward in time. But if you have uh, stochastic ordinary differential equations, and you're going forward in time, actually a lot of theory is works just the same way as it does for, uh, for deterministic ordinary differential equations. But once you go backward in time, you have this additional uh, difficult technical issue about uh, adaptedness. So you must never look into the future. And of course, on the one hand, you must never look in the future. On the other hand, you need to hit a certain terminal condition at the terminal time. Okay, and the only way how you can reconcile these two constraints is by adding another component to the solution, okay? So the solution to this BSD is not the process Y alone, but it's a pair of processes Y, Z, where Z in some sense could be seen as a Lagrange multiplier ensuring their adaptiveness. Okay, so the solution here is not a single process Y, it's a couple, Y set. Another way to think about the set is, uh, this is maybe more uh, relevant for people who come from the stochastic world, is if you take uh, the drift F to be zero. Okay, if the drift is zero, then a uh, solution, an existence of a solution just follows from the martingale representation theorem. So that means if F is zero, then Y is a martingale. So in other words, YT is just the conditional expectation of Xi given FT. And then the martingale representation theorem tells you that there is a process set uh, such that Y can be written as an integral of set with respect to the Brownian motion. And indeed, if you know a little bit of Malheur calculus, the Clark Cohn formula gives you some kind of uh, uh, explicit formula for set in that case. Okay, so that's backward stochastic differential equations. Now, the thing is, even though this looks very complicated on the first side, in fact, theory of BSDs is not so much more involved than theory of SDs. In particular, you have like classical usual Lipschitz conditions, then you have existence and uniqueness of solutions. All right. Now let's go right into it. So how does this uh, uh, process look like? How does the PDE look like? So just let me go back. Just to mention, of course, we have defined a, a random field U. So there is no need, I mean, in, in, in other words, we start with an object and we want to verify that this object satisfies a certain differential equation, but we already know, U is already defined. Okay, so what is the backward stochastic partial differential equation that our object satisfies? It's the following. So you see here this BSPDE. The first thing that I want you to do is imagine that the Psi was not there. So if Psi is zero, then this is nothing but the Black-Scholes PDE. Okay? If Psi is zero, we have the Black-Scholes PDE. Okay, and now what is the role of the Psi? Well, the Psi set is, is exactly the same role as the set had before with the BSDEs. So this is kind of, if you want this kind of Lagrange multiplier, which guarantees adaptedness, even though we have random coefficients V, we have the stochastic driver, this Brownian motion W, and we have a terminal condition. In this case, the terminal condition is actually uh, deterministic, but does, that doesn't change anything, right? It's kind of weird to think about it, but 
uh, in our case, kind of the problem comes from a deterministic terminal condition where the coefficients are random. Okay. Now, a theorem, this is not a statement, this is not the definition, this is a theorem. And the theorem says that indeed there is a random field psi such that the pair u psi is the unique weak solution of the BSPD that I've written down here. And uh, what do I mean by weak solution here? Um, this is a, a, a notion that is a bit uh, uh, adapted to the problem at hand. But at first, weak solution here is understood as weak in the usual PDE sense. So in other words, I have a, a, a distribution at first plants a priori U and Psi are distribution valid processes. And by distribution valid processes, I mean distributions in X in space. They're like normal processes in time, but distributions only in X. And the differential equation holds in the sense of distributions. So again, this is the normal, the normal PD uh, sense, right? So this means you multiply both sides of the equation with a test function in, in a, a test function in X. You integrate against x, then you do integration by parts until all your space dimensions, all your space derivatives are only on the test function. That's what this means. So the standard thing. Then we have the terminal condition that's also pretty standard. And now comes the kind of uh, special thing. Those three terms here, ut, square root of v times uh, the derivative of psi, and square root of v derivative u plus psi are actually functions in X. They are not just distributions. And this solution concept may look weird at first glance, but you will see when I, when I give you a, a kind of a sketch of the proof, you will, you will see why this is a very natural and very convenient concept for us here. Okay, some remarks before we go there. Um, from a BSPD theory, I mean, there's a theory of backward stochastic partial differential equations, of course. And the main difficulty from that point of view is that V is unbounded and can be zero. So you remember, you have this kind of parabolic equation, but V is unbounded and can be zero. And of course, from your PDE uh, uh, analysis courses, you will see that this gives you this a potential headache. Okay. On the plus side, our arguments may uh, do not depend on the linearity of the equation. So you could, uh, you could add a very general nonlinearity of the following type, right? So basically you can be nonlinear in, in T, X, in ut, and in a certain specific way, also in the derivative of ut. And again, you will see why these kind of weird formulas pop up here. Okay. And uh, regarding the proof, there are basically two main tools that we use for the proof. The one tool is the ito wenzel krylov formula. So what is this formula about? Um, it's a very general type of ITO formula where you're given, on the one hand, an ITO process XT, capital XT. On the other hand, you are giving a random field U, which satisfies a kind of weak uh, ITO process. Okay, so it, set, it satisfies a, a dynamic like this in the sense of distribution. And then you consider another random field, which is defined by plugging in the capital XT in the argument of UT. Okay, so UT of X plus XT, this is your new VT of X. And what the ito wenzel krylov formula give you is uh, a distributional dynamic of that type for the new process, for the new field V. Okay, so this is the first ingredient. The second ingredient, is a stochastic Feynman cuts formula. So we are using a stochastic representation uh, to prove uh, our uh, existence and uniqueness theorem. 
In other words, we are going to represent the, 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 the field U as some kind of, by, by the solution of a, in our case, backwards stochastic differential equation, okay? And uh, in fact, here actually this kind of, uh, uh, you will see what happens because the backward differential equation, the backward stochastic differential equation looks like follows, okay? So this nonlinear part here, if it's present, gives it a drift. And if it's not, then it's just, uh, uh, say, it's just the martingale representation, it's just the martingale corresponding to the terminal value that I've written down here, okay? Uh, now we have two driving Brownian motions. So the, the process set, so this kind of uh, Lagrange multiplier now has two components. So there's a process set tilde and a process set. And uh, the theorem that we are using, the stochastic feynman katz representation, tells you that the solution, the random field U, evaluated on at the process capital X actually coincides with the solution Y of the BSD. And moreover, you can express the derivative of U and Psi in terms of set and set tilde. Okay, and now if you go back to the condition here, you see that this condition is saying that Y set and set tilde are actual functions of X. So this condition was imposed to make sure that you can formulate the BSD. And now uh, the existence and uniqueness theorem essentially uh, works as follows. You verify that indeed the solution U is linked to the BSD solution in that way. And then you use the existence and uniqueness uh, theorem for the BSD. I mean, I have written down some formulation before, but actually need a rather general one for this, but nonetheless an existing one, a classical one even, uh, to get existence and uniqueness of the BSPD solution. Okay. And like the main part of the work really is that all these results, I, I glossed over a lot of impeccability conditions. So in fact, like this theorem, but also the ito wenzel krilov formula, they all require certain impeccability conditions. So the main work in the proofs is actually to verify that the uh, uh, solution U that we defined actually satisfies these impeccability conditions. So far, so good. But eventually, as you remember, we wanted to consider American options, or in other words, solve optimal stopping problems. And fortunately, a similar equation, a similar BSPD holds for the solution of the American option pricing problem. Okay, let's define V as the solution of the optimal stopping problem in the same manner. And to be honest, we didn't actually prove the existence and uniqueness theorem. It should be true in the same way. But in fact, what should happen is basically you get, once again, like the uh, like you take the, the deterministic PDE for the American option price, and then you turn it into the BSPD uh, analogon and that should actually be the pricing PDE for this problem, okay? So what is the pricing PDE for an American option in a, in a, in a Mark for a Markovian framework? Well, it's a hammering jacobi bellman equation. It's highly nonlinear, in fact. And one way to formulate this is kind of as a variation of inequality. So basically what, what, you, what you, you realize is that the price is always lower bounded by the payoff at any time. But of course, uh, you need to add uh, some kind of penalty into the dynamics to guarantee this. Some nonlinear. This is where the nonlinearity comes in. There are various ways how to formulate this. This is one way, and indeed, the same holds true in this non-Markovian framework. 
right? This mu is this term, right? The mu basically is the nonlinearity, or you could say it's another Lagrange multiplier. And in a similar way, as the European pricing process was linked to a BST, now uh, this uh, backward stochastic variational inequality, if you want, is linked to a reflected BST. Okay, once again, Y has to satisfy that it is bounded below from, from H applied to EX, XSTX. And uh, that means that we have to add kind of local time increment uh, DA to the Y dynamics. And once again, the A is only active when you actually have, in, have an equality in, in this constraint. Okay. So let's now come numeric, to numerics. Um, in the next two slides, I want to give you a very quick overview of what, what are numerical methods for uh, uh, standard Markovian BSDs, okay? So for standard BSDs, and now I have added actually an X dynamics uh, uh, because we anyway need it in our set too. Um, so what do you do? I mean, the first thing you can do is you do an Euler scheme, okay? And now you see, I mean, it's natural to start at the terminal time because, well, you have a terminal condition. So you know your solution at the terminal time. You do a backward step of your Euler scheme, but then you realize, so, expressing yti as a function of yti plus one. But of course, then you realize if you do that, then your yti is still going to be fti plus one measurable. So you have to take conditional expectations, condition on fti to ensure the adaptedness. And that in a nutshell is the Euler scheme, okay? Now, you are probably missing the uh, DW term here, but of course, after you took the conditional expectation, it's anyway gone, so you don't need to add it to begin with. And of course, as usual, you can use, I mean, you can use implicit Euler step, Euler schemes as I did here, but you could also do an explicit Euler, step, Euler scheme where you have uh, Y evaluated Ti plus one here. And for the set, well, this is now, uh, if, you have, if you know the y, then you can reconstruct the set by just multiplying with the brown and increment and taking expectations. Okay, so this is the classical method. Now, the problem with this is, of course, that taking conditional expectations is highly, is computationally very, very expensive. So, and this is, I think, the reason why this, uh, I mean, you see, I have glossed over this a little bit, but of course, the general message or one message here was that by solving such a BSD, you can solve numerically certain nonlinear PDs. So for like 15 years, this was, or 20 years, I would even say this was pushed as a method to solve nonlinear PDEs in high dimensions. But the difficulty is with con taking condition expectations. This is the reason basically why I think that this was never as uh, successful as the proponents really wanted. But then three years ago, there's this very nice paper by uh, Weiner E. Arnold Jensen and Han, where they use deep neural networks to solve this kind of nonlinear PDEs by actually solving the BSD. So, if you have seen their method, their, their paper, and I, th I guess a lot of lot of the people in the audience probably have seen that paper, then you have to, you, you need to realize that they are using the, the BSD to solve this problem. So what are they doing? They actually use a forward discretization of the, of the BSD. So they start by uh, parameterizing the initial value, which is unknown, of course. Y zero of theta by a neural network and theta is now the, the weights of the neural network. And they additionally uh, consider a, a family of neural networks uh, uh, calligraphic set I for the process set at time Ti, okay? 
Now they do the forward time discretization of the process Y, which gives you eventually the value Y tilde of capital T, which now depend on all the parameters of all the neural networks that went into it. And now you take the loss function, which is just the mean squared error between the approximate value Y tilde at time capital T, and it's actually actual uh, terminal value, okay? And then you minimize the loss. And of course, you notice that this is a global minimization problem. So you train all these neural networks at the same time together. So you have n plus one neural networks which you train at the same time together. But once you have trained this, you basically have everything. You have solved the, uh, the PD. Okay. Now, soon afterwards, there is this very nice paper by Yure, Farm and Barin, who basically look at this and say, well, but this is not, this is absolutely not necessary. We can go back and train the neural networks individually, basically using, you know, dynamic programming. If we discretize the BSD, for, uh, backward in time rather than forward in time. And if you want, this is a very trivial observation because what they are basically saying is let's compute the conditional uh, expectation by nonlinear regression using deep neural networks. Okay? Linear regression would be like the most standard method to, so, to, to compute conditional expectations. And they just say, let's try deep neural networks. Now, if you write this out, you basically use two neural networks for y, one for y, one for z for each time step. So I have parameter theta as a function of the time step here, theta i. Um, you start out at the terminal time. And then for each time you get a loss function, for each time step you get a, a, a loss function, which, um, well, which is based on this Euler step. Okay, so you compare the Y T I as you, as you parameterize it by the neural network against the right-hand side, including the set actually. So in other words, rather than training n plus one neural networks at once, you train two at a time. And in fact, there is redundancy here, right? Because you can express uh, the set as a space derivative of the y in some way. So alternatively, you can just use one neural network and uh, do some automatic differentiation of that neural network to get the set process, but uh, like practice suggests that this doesn't, this often doesn't work as well as you would hope. Okay, so it may actually make sense to use two neural networks rather than one and avoid automatic differentiation. Okay. Another important uh, practical tool they use is they use something that we could see as some type of reinforced learning that is the use I mean of course uh, if the time step is small then you expect that the yti plus one and the yti are close to each other so it makes sense to use the optimal value that you trained uh, at time e plus i plus one as an initial guess for time i okay now we are in a more complicated situation because we have a non-Markovian framework. So our networks need to take the whole past into account. And this is what we're doing. We will provide some uh, basic neural network theory for this kind of situation, but really we are following UEFA in our numerical examples. Uh, so what, what I was trying to say is in the European case, this BSPD uh, approximation uh, using neural networks work. You get the results that you expect to get up to the standard Monte Carlo error. Reference values here are computed by standard Monte Carlo simulation. Okay. The next plot is a kind of experiment which 
tries to you know, answer the question if the Markov, how severely is non-Markovian is the problem. So what did we do here? We, we put ourselves at time one half and we condition the paths of the variance process V to take the same value at time one half. So they all end up in this at time one half, but as you see on the uh, right hand side, from time zero to time one half, they look they, they, they look very different from each other. And now we compute also the, the stock price is the same, of course. Now we compute the option price at time one half. And of course, if this was a Markov process, then you would get the same number in all the four uh, uh, rows because for a Markov process, only the value at time one half would matter. But here you see that you have uh, considerable differences in the prices. So this process is considerably non-Markov, I would say. Admittedly, this is not a very you know, scientific argument here. These are just four samples, but still. I think it's an it's an interesting uh, observation. Now, uh, okay, sorry, I went in the wrong. Now let's go get back to the American option price. And here I have to say I have to admit there's something that I don't understand. So we again solve the uh, American pricing PDE. We actually do it using the BSD formulation. We do it by two methods. One is penalization. So basically you penalize. So remember you had this, uh, sorry here. You had this local time here. You have to, you have to push yourself above the uh, barrier given by the payoff function. Now there are basically two ways. I mean, there are many ways how you can solve this, but one is penalize add a strong drift if you are below the barrier. This is the first method that we use here, the first scheme. The second scheme is basically, well, follow your dynamics and whenever you are below the payoff, just uh, uh, replace this by the payoff. This is basically what you would do if you did a finite difference discretization of the American option price and PD. And now we compare against the results from the paper with Raoul and Søren, which is the reference value, and compare this against our uh, prices in our model. I mean, the good news is that two schemes give roughly the same results, at least up to the, numeric, uh, up to the Monte Carlo era, the bad news is they give very different results from the ones from we, we, we arrived at with Raoul and uh, Søren. Um, on the one hand, you could say, well, this scheme actually allows for non-Markovian problems, whereas the scheme we had with Raoul does not. So you might say you would rather trust the new scheme. I actually don't think that this is the case. For instance, I have another like working paper where we use an even more general scheme and it gives basically the same result that we got uh, back then. So again, the reference values. So it seems that even though the neural networks work very well for the European pricing PDE, even though they work very well when you, when you use it for the American pricing PS PDE, but for very simple dynamics, I think they don't very work very well for this rough Bergoni model. But I don't know. And this is maybe the biggest, uh, well, if somebody, I mean, I, I think this is, a, this is a, a, a important open problem in this rough volatility uh, business to actually be able to price American options. Finally, let me, Thank you for your attention. Let me apologize for the technical difficulties. This was the first Zoom meeting I had at my mother's house at all. Um, and uh, references, I mean, 
the paper with Raoul and Søren, the first one, then Briand de Lyon, who Pardou and Stoic uh, is a quite old by now, but powerful existential uniqueness uh, result for BSDs that we used for this theoretical part. Then the next paper is a representative paper by my colleague Chin Yao about uh, more standard theory for backward SPDEs. Finally, there is this paper by Yuri Farm and Barin, which I find very, very inspiring. And then there is Grilov's paper on the eco Wenzel formula. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Christian. So let's uh, see if we have questions from the audience. Hi, right, Christian. I have a couple of questions. Yes. So, Hi, Luis. How are you doing? Very complicated talk, huh? So in the when you show the PDE, I, I didn't I didn't grasp the continuity requirements for you. Yeah, so this D is uh, just uh is just what is the, the it's nabla in the dimension of X. Is that right? Yes. Oh, okay. So the even though it's still one dimension. Mm. The continuity requirement here is given by this uh, second gradient you have in the first term on the right hand side. Uh, yes. Right. So then I ask you this because then how do you meet these requirements when you design the deep neural network? Oh, um... I mean, you, how are the, the nonlinear functions between the layers? I think we are using, uh, we are using ReLU. Um, of course, what we're really solving is this, um, sorry, where is it here? What we're really solving is this PSD where X is just the parameter. I see. So, and in fact, I have no clue about the actual regularity of the solution in X. Mm. I suppose it will actually be very regular, at least if the terminal condition is regular. But uh, the theorem that we provide here actually works under minimal regularity. I mean, the existence and uniqueness theorem here just requires you to be a function in x like a you know a measurable function mm -hmm. i see okay thank you thank you uh, more questions uh christian um Hi, can, I, can i also ask a question First of all, thank you for the talk. Excellent. Uh, I you really explained a lot of stuff that I've been meaning to learn about. So thank you very much. For it. Um, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so the one thing I wanted to, to clarify is about the maybe notation, maybe the setup. So in the previous slide number, I think eight, possibly or nine. Yeah, here. So is FT the filtration with respect to W and B? Yes. Yeah, that's the one. So what I'm trying to understand is that if I'm conditioning X itself is adapted with respect to FT, correct? Mm -hmm. So if I'm conditioning on FT, um, then how, I mean, it doesn't make sense to me why I would then um, set X at time small t to an X because X at sm times small t to, um, is determined by FT. Now I could, you could make these two independent, say, um, here's the history and here's the, the, the value uh, and, and make these completely independent. But I assume in reality, or, or if, if I'm interested in pricing, I have a, I observe the path of W or the path mm -hmm. of uh, um, uh, the path of W, or the path of B, then I have a particular value for XT at time small t. And I also have the filtration. So how does it make sense to make these two well, I would say that, like, okay, of course, if this was a Markovian situation, then there wouldn't be a difference, right? I mean, yeah. 
taking this t lowercase x is the same as condition. Sure. Yeah, here it's different. Um, but here it's different. And what I, in some sense, what I would like to do is I would basically take the x and integrate out the b. Or more precisely, I would like to integrate out the x dynamic, but not the v. Right. And this is, if you, th if you think about it, this is what's happening here. Like the whole X dynamic is like in the differential operator. And then you have the W, which is the one guy which drives the V, right? Precisely. Precisely. So, so, so then doesn't that, um, I, I, would, I would assume that a, a one way of doing this would be just to define a new object, which would you, or you condition not on FT, but on FVT. And um, so, but, but that's 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 what's happening. I mean, the the UTX is actually FW measurable, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean I, I, if you're asking me if I could also write here FW instead of FT, I have to admit I don't know. Yeah, the, the, I never thought. Yeah, um, the, the what I was thinking as well is that if I just Condition on uh, on v, then I have the normal black Scholes, right? The the normal Femmerkac. So mm -hmm. if I just condition on f f v, and and then um, I can I can do my pricing just based on, on the independent history of v. Well, but then you are doing something different, right? If I just condition. Oh, you mean you mean you condition on on v for the whole interval from zero to capital T. Zero to small t. No, but then you have still the dependence on the past, right? Of the I, V from... Yes, yes, that's true. That's, that's true, okay. Okay. Um, I mean, to be honest, I struggled with that formulation too. And to be even more honest, I think we had a couple of wrong formulations of this <laughs> definition before right. hopefully before the preprint and not now but 